Hello, hello. I am Mayor Watt. That is my site. That right there. Way up there. Way, way up there. Oh, I went off the screen. Oh, I almost lost my hand. I think that's how that works, right? No? Okay. Well, anyway. Uh, again, I am Mayor Watt. I'm the mayor of Ometown. That's Ometown, Ometown.com. I'm over on YouTube as well. I'm going to start streaming over there. Pretty simple. I'm also going to be streaming here on Twitch. And I'll, always there's the podcast. And um, if you're in my chat, hello. Welcome to Ometown. Uh, so if you're new, I am basically talking about news. And that news gets aggregated by Ometown.com. It's a custom aggregation site uh, that I use in my daily life. Uh, throughout the day, I gather intelligence that I use, um, in my business and, um, what I do for a living basically is, uh, educate people about technology, business, and sociology, sociological forces, society. And I merged all together and I talk about it here in the context of the news. That's my value add. Uh, I plan on extending that uh, into other areas and those other areas are actually 50 channels that are represented here across six main categories, create news, education, entertainment, social, and technology. Within those are those 50 channels that I was talking about, and I hope to bring them all to Twitch and to YouTube and to the podcast. With that in mind, I'm just going to get into today's news and see what happens. So the very first article is here in the daily news show again i'll be referencing which channels these news articles get thrown in by my aggregator based on various uh, elements um, primarily how i've tagged the source um, but this first one is in the daily news show channel but it's sourced from abc news and it's about how to watch the total blood moon eclipse this weekend and so the little snippet that my aggregator grabbed says stargazers all over the world will have an opportunity to see a blood moon over the weekend as a lunar eclipse moves into Earth's orbit. So these actually happen quite a bit, uh, but some of the problem is that it happens over open ocean and nobody gets to see a full eclipse, uh, solar or otherwise. It happens pretty regularly. Um, but let's go over to the source. <clears throat> Again, it's ABC News. It's written by Julia uh, Jacobo. And I always uh, state who the author is and the source of the news. Um, I'm uh, really interested in getting some conversation going in chat, but really uh, I encourage you to go over and read the article because the article will have subtle nuance that I just won't hint at in the uh, stream uh, but if you don't make it to go over there in time, because you're not always sitting in chat and, and copying and pasting these links, it'll be in the show notes over at YouTube and in the podcast. Um, so it says the penumbral eclipse, when the moon is completely immersed in the penumbral cone of the earth without touching the umbra, the inner part of earth's shadow is expected to begin Sunday just after 9.30 p.m., according to NASA. Uh, the penumbral eclipse it results in only part of the moon going dark. So you'll end up seeing it look like that. Um, so there are a lot of uh, very motivated people online. And so you will probably be able to see this on Twitch and on YouTube and um, maybe even other sites. I'm, I'm really not sure who all will be live streaming something like this. Um, but you will undoubtedly see photographs appear uh, on <laughs> most social networks, uh, Insta and, and um, TikTok and, and Twitch and Twitter and YouTube and, oh, so many. Um, at any rate, if you've never seen uh, a total or partial eclipse um, or a blood moon, um, now's your chance to see one over the weekend. Although Sunday night at 10 is pretty much Monday, at least to me. 
Call me cynical. If you're in my chat, go ahead, throw it in there. Call me cynical. Anyway, the next article is over in the Word in Tech. That's one of the channels that I intend to bring to uh, Twitch and to YouTube and the uh, podcast. So there's a whole network that's planned. I just need to slowly ramp it up. And um, this here, it says a court just blew up the internet because it thinks YouTube is no website. Yesterday, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals decided in favor of Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton in a lawsuit over uh, HB 20, a bizarre law effectively banning many apps and websites from moderating posts by Texas residents. The court granted Paxton a stay on an earlier ruling to block the law, letting HB 20 go into effect immediately while the rest of the case proceeds. The decision was handed down without explanation, but court watchers weren't necessarily surprised because it followed an equally bizarre hearing earlier in the week, one that should alarm almost anyone who runs a website. Yeah. So to summarize this, you're allowed free speech even in a private venue that's open to the public in in the perspective of Attorney General Ken Paxton um, and whoever it is that's motivating Attorney General Ken Paxton to make this possible. But I am of the mind that just like moderation in any, in the, in Uh, Twitch chat, in YouTube comments, on a website, in my house, wherever it is. This forum exists because I've put together this uh, interaction between me and other people. And so it's really incumbent upon me if I choose to moderate tightly or loosely. That is my, my prerogative. And it isn't mandated by anybody else. Even if I open my business to the public, there are no rights that allow you to say and do whatever you want in my space, in my business, in my house, in my forums, during my stream. This is nothing more than some political aspiration to get a particular type of person interested in paying attention to you. Um, and it's absurd, and this will undoubtedly be thrown out eventually. It just takes money and time and, and dedication to the task. Um, but there is nothing that will stop me from banning somebody from Texas for making stupid comments. There is nothing that will stop me from kicking somebody from Texas out of my house. There is nothing that will stop me from uh, shadow banning somebody or blocking somebody on Texas, uh, from Texas on Twitter or YouTube or wherever else. But because you're a website, suddenly you can't do that. It's absurd. It doesn't make any sense. Um, But while you scream, they are trying to take over. You're also, and my perspective here is this is their, this is their mental machinations or machinations. You want to pronounce it that way because they wanted a certain way, which is siloed, protected, not your way, which to me, I'm more open. I want everybody involved, except that you just can't be bananas. You can't sit there and say wildly. Uh, unsupported statements and and get away with it and it happens in the real world and it happens online and there should be no surprise there this is the sociological forces that i'm talking about along with business they're in conflict this person is saying you can't limit my ability to say whatever i want on your website while mandating that you're not allowed to stop somebody from saying whatever they want on a website. It's so um, convoluted mental gymnastics wherein you can allow somebody, you are now forced to allow someone to make statements that can harm somebody because they're from Texas. (laughs) But no, this won't stand. This, the, I don't know how this person even became an attorney general, Um, but let's go on. Let's go to the source. This is an article over at The Verge, 
and um, it's from uh, Addie Robertson. And they said that's not actually the worst part. Um, and it's not just about YouTube. It's about any network that is or any uh, website that's open to the public. Um, you're not allowed to moderate. So to, it says here, HB20, to recap a little, bans social media platforms from removing, da downranking, demonetizing, or otherwise, otherwise discriminating against content based on the viewpoint of the user or another person. And it applies to any internet website or application that hits 50 million monthly active users and enables users to communicate with other users with exceptions for internet service providers and media sites. So the reason why they've encapsulated internet service providers and media sites is because they have safe harbor, but so does every website. It has safe harbor. If I don't moderate, then I have safe harbor. But the moment I start moderating, I lose safe harbor. That is some of the claim that is floating out there. Just nobody has challenged it. So it says uh, social networks also aren't allowed to ban users based on their uh, location in Texas, a provision clearly meant to stop sites from simply pulling out of the state, which might be the simplest solution for many of them. Yeah, well, I don't have 50 million concurrent users, but if I was, and now they're even saying you're not allowed to block somebody from Texas. So that's like saying you're allowed to enter my domain simply because you're from Texas, because there's some state law, but that's absurd. I can do business with whomever I want. If I want a relationship with somebody in a commercial sense, then I can open my doors. Eh, I lost somebody from my chat. I guess they didn't like what I had to say. Um, the Monday hearing put Paxton and net choice attorney in front of fifth circuit court judges, Leslie Southwick, Andrew Oldham, and Edith Jones. Things were dicey from the beginning. Paxton argued the social media companies should be treated as common carriers because the, of their market power, which would require them to treat all content neutrally the way that phone companies do, which is absurd. Uh, something no established law comes even close to requiring. In fact, thanks to Republican repeal of net neutrality laws, even internet service providers like Comcast and Verizon aren't common carriers. Yeah. But this is a political thing. This isn't even a commercial thing. This is all about political sway and trying to force somebody's um, marginalizing and closed door type of policy and, and attitude. They want to limit the influence of uh, everybody else by forcing some really backward thinking onto a platform. They, they want to force completely antisocial, completely uh, uh, unsupported claims about so many things. It's ridiculous. Okay. So I got to keep going. I, again, I only have an hour. Um, this is a, in the mobile channel. Uh, time to get out. Arizona's election security chief quits over threats and conspiracies. Arizona is ground zero for stolen election lies operationalized. Republicans launched an audit that became a symbol of voting conspiracies and made the cyber ninjas a household name. No, it didn't. Um, they transformed former President Trump's attacks into a draconian new round of election subversions. They even asked voters to be willing to die to defend the stolen election. Let's click the link. It takes us over to vice.com. And uh, this is a, a new segment by uh, Todd Zwillich. Ken Matta was dire, has dire a warning about his state handing over election integrity to election deniers and conspiracy theorists. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, and it was an absurd audit. There wasn't anything found. Um, and, and they were looking for something. They were trying to force something into existence and there isn't anything. The biggest thing that they, their claim is that it all happened in the dead of night, except that they have no idea what batch processing of data is. You don't just constantly feed information into the system, particularly when you're on a limited budget and you have limited bandwidth because everybody is anti-government in, in this particular ilk of thinking. 
you have to batch process it just like the old school days of an, uh, commercial enterprise everything would pile in sometimes it still happens today everything piles into the kitty so to speak into a particular centralized location and then at midnight it processes out and all of the funds come in or the data transfers whatever it is and then it gets processed that's what batch processing is you can do it in little tranches you know some places do it every eight hours other people do it all the time you know my enterprise says uh, process and take the money or deliver the goods or whatever it is immediately but that's not what can be done when everything is virtualized in silos of polling stations you go you vote everything waits until later that's why they have exit polls they don't have real-time results and then data gets pushed out and you have results real results but well th this next election you'll see what the transformation is around how transparent and public the elections are if the wrong people get access to controlling the election process you'll see some really wacky stuff like people putting balloons in front of a camera that's there to audit and this happened in other places other countries and where election fraud is just rampant and i think that people are going to be taking lessons from that so let's hope not but I really think that's what's going to end up happening. So let's continue on. The next article is in Smack Talk. Apple TV Plus uh, debuting a full lineup of new kids and family shows in the summer. Apple TV Plus has announced a new lineup of uh, content geared toward kids and families. That's set to debut in the summer, including a new series like Duck and Goose and Best Foot Forward. Let's click the link. It takes us over there. Um... Hmm, interesting. Okay, so this is an article over at appleinsider.com by Mike Peterson. And um, what else do they have in there? Later in the summer, Apple shows win include a Surfside Girls, a show, a series based on IDW graphic novels by Kim Dwindle, as well as Life by Ella. Um, Apple says the latest show is a story of a young girl as she takes a new outlook on life into a world that seems determined to break it down. Hmm. And there's a new peanut special called Lucy's School. It's kind of like this. Mayor Watts School. Okay, the next article, and we'll keep on trucking through all of the articles. The next article is uh, Black Hole Scientist, Wherever We Look, We Should See Donuts. Discovering something for the second time doesn't usually have scientists jump out of their seats with excitement, but that's exactly what happened in this case of Sagittarius A, or Sag A star. Okay. The second black hole imaged. So, pardon me. So, um, I was watching another stream uh, the other night. Well, actually, it was last night. And... Um, uh, they were just so wrong about what they were saying, but this isn't an optical image. This isn't, this is radio waves that have been picked up and um, picked up by a global network of uh, receiving stations that basically um, stored a ton of data, petabytes of information onto hard drives, onto storage devices. And then they had to shuttle these over uh, from various places around the planet to uh, the uh, research center that basically was the collaboration point where all of the signals were deciphered and the construction of the black hole was created from what amounts to as waves of energy that buffet the earth um, from million, 50 million light years away. <laughs> and so what we see in the picture here, um, this is a, an article over at fizz.org by Daniel Stolt uh, from University of Arizona. But this is not in a, a true image of what the star looks like. This is, this is an image based on the radio waves that have been received by these 
um, receiving stations here um, on Earth. So it says, in 2019, the image of M87, a supermassive black hole in a galaxy more than 50 million light years away from Earth, graced the cover of pages of virtually every news outlet across the world. Well, this is Sag A, Sagittarius A. Uh, Ozil said she fell in love with Sagittarius A 20 years ago when she was a graduate student then working for her dissertation and uh, working on her dissertation at Harvard University. So her research culminated in a seminal paper uh, which she published in 2000 with um, Demetrios Saltis, a University of Arizona professor of astronomy and physics and principal investigator of the International Black Hole Pyre Project. And in the paper, and a follow-up paper published in 2001, she identified M87 star, uh, the first black hole ever imaged. And SAG A is the two ideal black holes that presented even more a remote chance of having their pictures taken. So there's a whole lot of comparison between M87 and SAG A. Um, one is extremely uh, bright, I guess you could call it, um, and, and massive, and the other is not. Um, but they appear equal in size because SAG A is closer. Um, so Let's see, Sag A located a mere 25,000 light years from Earth is puny by comparison at only 4 million solar masses compared to 6 billion for M87. The real problem with Sag A is that it there's a whole lot of obstruction between Sag A and Earth, and so they had to cut through um, all of that noise. Um, and it's really obstructions. There's what amounts to dust between us and Sag A. Well, anyway, um, they ultimately get all of the data and they turn it into this kind of a picture and, and it changes over time. And the embodiment of it represents a, just a ton of data about what it is in the black hole, um, how it's made, uh, how large it is, even the things that are being influenced uh, around it. And so it's really amazing. Um, and there is a really good video that is provided by um, Veritasium, so CGP Gray, and uh, go check it out over on YouTube because um, it makes it pretty straightforward about what you're seeing. Um, so let's continue on. The next article is in uh, the Continuity Report, and it's about Firestarter, the Stephen King novel turned movie uh, back in the 80s and is coming back apparently now the stephen king no novel on which the new fire starter is based was published in 1980 during a phase of the horror master's career in which the writer seemed fascinated by kids with inexplicable powers charlie played by drew barrymore in the 84 film um and uh, others and um it was back then it was a fun flick um I haven't watched it since it was released, I'd say, uh, but they're bringing it back. And so let's see here. It says it is cut from similar cloth as Danny from The Shining. And if you've never seen The Shining um, or Carrie or gosh, there's so many, um, you should uh, start watching some movies and maybe we can have a movie night here at hometown. Uh, King's work would inspire generations. L and uh, Stranger Things it was a great deal to Charlie, for one, which made a remake of the 40-year-old tale of Pyromania inevitable. So we'll go over to Roger Ebert, and there is this um, Firestarter review by uh, Brian Tolerico. And uh, like most things here, I'm more interested in motivating you to go and see Firestarter and then coming and talking with uh, to me about it. Um, I haven't seen the new Firestarter, uh, but it is apparently based on the novel, so it won't deviate too much, I'd say, from the original 1984 film. Um, but it'll have somebody new, and it'll uh, be a new introduction to um, Firestarter and that style of, um, I guess, not really a horror film. I mean, it's, it's, I, I don't, I didn't see it as a horror film. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what their take is on a 21st century um, 
who knows what perspective is going to be there. Um, it says, uh, you see, they have powers too. products of experiments from MK ultra type program run by something called the shop. So if you've never ended up going down the rabbit hole of what MK ultra is, um, there's a whole lot uh, to unpack in this review. So go check it out over at uh, rogerebert.com by way of uh, hometown. So the next article and something that is interesting to me because I'm very interested in exercise equipment um, and uh, more specifically exercise equipment that gives me telemetry. So I have a, a, a rower right now, but it isn't very smart. Um, in fact, it's so dumb, it probably can act better as a, a door jam than anything else. But uh, Peloton's annual homecoming event is for the fans where uh, it's where the fitness tech company teases new products as well as drops new features and content. It's also a chance for fans to take live classes taught by their favorite instructors and attend special panel discussions. Uh, let's click the link and just see what it's all about. So they hinted at a, a new rower. So this article is over at The Verge by Victoria Song. And uh, again, you can follow the show notes and uh, go over to all of these articles. So they've got the Peloton pro, uh, tread. They've got the bike. Now they're going to have the rower, maybe. We'll see. I don't think they... They don't have any pictures in the article of the rower, it seems. Um... In the most recent quarter, even with an increase in subscription cancellations following news of a price hike, the churn rate actually improved to 0.75%. The question is whether that'll change. I suspect that it will continue to um, not churn, but uh, subscriptions are going to continue to decline. Um, yeah. Let's just continue on. Uh, the next article. The next article is over in The Word in Tech. New study lays out hidden backstory behind deadly Pacific Northwest heat wave. Last summer, a deadly heat wave uh, struck the Pacific Northwest, causing temperatures to soar more than 30 degrees Fahrenheit above normal and killing more than 1,000 people. Oh. <clears throat> and there you go. Uh, Luis Lerner from University of Chicago wrote this article over at phys.org, and there's a picture of this heat wave, and it's just massive across the northwest. A new study has uncovered the sequence of events that precipitated the disaster, providing information that could further our understanding of heat formation on the North American continent. And by reviewing large-scale weather conditions, pardon me, Um, before the heat wave, University of Chicago scientists discovered that a cyclone spawned an anticyclone, which combined to produce and then trap heat near the surface of the region. So it's all about pressure and pressure changes. Um, and, uh, with the, um, environmental changes that are afoot, we have been warned for 20 years plus that there will be increasing variations, destabilizations of the status quo in our environment, uh, particularly in terms of heat and cold and their distribution wherever they are. And so I am not surprised and we will probably end up with another uh, heat wave um, simply because the machinations that make our environment the way that it is are changing based on us polluting the water and the air around us um, to the point where uh, the, the earth is basically uh, in turmoil as it seeks uh, a relative um, level of stasis. It needs to have some type of stability and we are changing the processes uh, enough to affect the earth, particularly the oceans. Um, the next article, and I'm gonna have to keep moving, 
The next article is in the Hatch Ideas channel. Elon Musk's Twitter bid is now a Friday the 13th horror show that will likely result in these three outcomes, according to Wedbush. So Elon Musk's Twitter bid actually is on hold right now while they evaluate certain things. Elon Musk's deal to take Twitter private has become a quote-unquote circus show, according to Wedbush's Dan Ives, uh, who wrote a note Friday morning uh, with, an with the analyst eyeing several potential outcomes to the saga. So I can predict one is that the price is going to change. Another is that the deal will fall through entirely. Um, but the third one might be, I don't know. Let's see. This is an article over at Business Insider by Brian Evans. So let's see what will happen. Uh, let's see what uh, Ives says. The comment follow, uh, Ives' comment follow in the wake of Musk's early morning tweet saying that the deal's on pause over fake accounts and bots. Um, they don't mention bots in this article, uh, but that was something that I had heard. And it says shares of the social media company fell as much as 25% in pre-market trading after the tweet, pairing the loss to about 9% in trading at 40.91 as of 10 a.m. Um, that's what the article is stating. So they say, uh, Ives says that there's three possible paths from here, given the latest developments, with the first being Wall Street will see Musk's tweet as a sign the deal is nowhere close to getting done. Um, another possibility, according to Ives, is the new developments open the door for Musk to renegotiate the terms and the price. Um, at one for one. Um, that first one is weird. That it, I mean, the the inference there is that, or I should say, the implication is that the deal won't go through. Um, and uh, let's see. And I guess the third one is that Musk could walk away from the deal entirely uh, for a breakup fee of $1 billion. Wow. Musk has already vastly changed the market, and his comments Friday bring into questions the pillars of the deal thus far, like his outside financing and investor positions. Yeah, I think because he's leveraged stuff, he may take that hit um, just to bow out because he needs to be in damage control simply because of this and it's way too public the disclosure that he is he's basically hammering the stock and the integrity of twitter's business processes he's come in he's steamrollered everybody and now it's just going to cost him a billion dollars which he'll make back in a heartbeat um, but if not already i mean he could have bought on the collapse and now has diluted the number of shares so that the price per share isn't so high and then he can sell it when it's back up um, even if he just remains silent um, or you know a major stockholder or shareholder um, but doesn't actually influence twitter so all three of those are possible uh, but i see the possibility of him uh, bowing out quite high. Uh, the next article is how dragonflies write themselves. I thought this one was an interesting article. Uh, simply a trio of researchers, two with Cornell University, the other with Howard Hughes Medical Institute, has discovered the means by which dragonflies are able to write themselves so quickly from an upside down orientation. Let's click the link. It's kind of like a Science Friday thing. Um, how dragonflies write themselves when dropped upside down. Bob Yurka of fizz.org is the author of this article. Um, I think it's probably similar to the way that other inse insects and even birds uh, write themselves. It says dragonflies are uh, flying insects characterized by wings of tra uh, pairs of transparent wings, long, thin body, and multifaceted compound eyes. Oh, that's me. I'm a dragonfly. Uh, anyway, uh, they are generally seen around ponds and marshes. So it's hard to explain how they write themselves. You kind of have to watch this uh, video that's over there at fizz.org. Um, but they use video to create a computerized 3D model of the dragonflies as they righted themselves. Then they were able to see exactly what the dragonflies were doing as they fell. 
They were pitching their left and right wings at slightly different angles, forcing their bodies to rotate until they were once again right side up. And that's pretty much what everybody does to right themselves from a falling position. Cats do it. Birds do it. Most animals do it. Humans are kind of derpy. Yeah. We try, try to ride our head, I think, more than our bodies. Um, and we have no real way to facilitate that. So we're like a sack of wet flour when we fall. So let's continue on to the next article. Uh, the continuity report. Um, I clicked this simply because of the inflammatory words used in the uh, article's headline. The time traveler's wife is a waste in every possible way. I, I thought that that was so succinct uh, that I was going to go and disrupt that succinctness by blabbering on about it because I've never even seen the time traveler's wife. But it says the real star of HBO's adaptation of the time traveler's wife based on Audrey Niffinger, Niffinger's, Niffinger's um, 2003 novel. I can't pronounce that last name. Um, which was turned into a movie starring Rachel McAdams and Eric Bana in 2009, isn't Rose Leslie, who plays Claire, and whom you'd hardly recognize as Egret from Game of Thrones due to her decent acting and near-perfect American accent, Theo James, who plays Henry, Claire's creeptastic time-traveling boyfriend and an eventual husband, isn't the star either, and not just because his wooden performance would have, I would be more interesting if he were actually a tree. <laughs> wow. No, the real star of this woeful, pointless television program is its toxic gender and sexual politics. <laughs> wow. Okay, this is an article over uh, a review uh, over at Roger Ebert by Nandini Valiel. Um, and uh, you'll have to go and read the rest of this thing uh, because what I just read is just one paragraph of it. So. Uh, go over and check it out and uh, hopefully you'll you'll like it. Um, so I guess I'm going to have to watch some of this. I haven't watched the show. I haven't watched the movie. Um, the plot here could have been created by shoving every rom-com made between 1995 and 2005 plus a copy of Christopher Nolan's Interstellar into an auto-regressive language model. Wow, they must be a, a tech of some kind. When she's six years old, Claire Abshire meets Henry de Tambol, and people think my name is weird. Okay. In a meadow near her rich parents' idyllic country home. Wow. This goes weird right out of the gate. Anyway, go check it out. I've got three more articles. The next article is um, Bag This All Time, uh, This All AMD Gaming PC with RX 66 XT and 6-core Ryzen for just $1,100. Uh, I don't have anything to do with this other than um, computer equipment is outlandishly priced depending on where you go, and I wanted to uh, provide um, some source for a reasonable pricing for high-end equipment. This is a mid-range PC for AMD enthusiasts, so it might need a storage upgrade. That's always the case, depending on just how intense you are as a gamer. Um, but it's an article over at PCGamer.com by Katie Wickens. And I'm going to hurry. You can follow the link here in um, the show notes. So... It's a 6-core, 12-thread CPU complete with integrated graphics and running a 3.9 gigahertz base. Um, let's see what else is in this. A Radeon XT, uh, XR, sorry. Oh my gosh. A Radeon RX 6600 XT is, it says, is comfortably quicker than NVIDIA's RTX 3060 offering, meaning it can throw out 100 frames in a hundred and uh, horizon zero dawn at 1080 with graphics set to ultimate yeah that's not bad at all um so go check it out and at 1100 bucks it's uh pretty reasonable if only because it's there and you can get it um and not in 12 weeks like some of the things that i'm looking for uh the next Article is over in Hatch Ideas. Uh, major meat companies lied about impending shortages to keep workers on site at the height of the pandemic, a House committee says. I'm going to throw that link into chat. 
A report by a bipartisan House committee details meat processing giants' response to the pandemic. One hospital doctor told JBS that all its COVID-19 patients were linked to a JBS plant in Texas. Interesting. Um, the company's exaggerated meat shortages to keep workers on site, according to the report. They were aware that their site was a hotbed for coronavirus transmission, but exaggerated impending product shortages so that they could keep workers on the site at the height of the pandemic. And this goes to my belief that the companies will abuse you until light is shining on the company and its processes. And it's not the company, it's the people. The, the people do despicable, horrible things to their employees and they get away with it because you can't shine the light without being called disgruntled or a whistleblower or something else. Um, and, and why do you think people are so irritated with businesses right now forming uh, countless unions and resigning and going trying to go somewhere else? Why? Because they want humanity put back into the business. Um, and small businesses abuse just as much as big businesses, except that it's even more angry as a response when you uh, try to stand up for yourself in a big business uh, because there's so much more money involved. There are, is a whole lot more vitriol thrown at you. Just treat everybody with respect for crying out loud. I know it's naive, but there's hope. Uh, this article is over at businessinsider.com and it's by Grace Dean and um, has a picture of a rusted front of a building uh, assigned to JBS. And uh, that's what they talk about. It says uh, they also lobbied the White House and U.S. Department of Agriculture to minimize coronavirus safety measures on the industry, according to the report, which was released on Thursday by the Bipartisan House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus. Meet. Processing sites were a major source of coronavirus outbreaks, triggering a wave of lawsuits. This was largely down to their lack of safety procedures like social distancing and staff's inability to work from home. Yeah, and that will always be the case. Um, if you have to do something on site, you will be exposed to the pandemic. And it won't go away because people have to go and do certain jobs, at least until they're automated. And then everybody will lose their job. So... It's kind of a lose, lose, lose. So let's continue on. It says here, uh, five states have shut down a metaverse casino, are trying to shut down a metaverse casino that investigators allege is run by Russian scammers who claimed they were buying digital land from Snoop Dogg. All right. Regulators in five states filed cease and desist orders against Flamingo Casino Club on Wednesday. The orders allege the Metaverse Casino promoted fraudulent NFT investments to U.S. residents, and the company is also accused of concealing alleged Russian ties with a fake office address. Yep. So this is an article by Hannah Toey over at businessinsider.com. Um, Security regulators in Texas, Wisconsin, Kentucky, New Jersey, and Alabama filed emergency orders Wednesday requiring the digital casino to cease its NFT business. Yeah, but as long as they are making money, they don't care, and they will just find some other way to, um, <laughs> I don't know, attempt to defraud someone. Um, and this is just one of those things where it's the, the FOMO, the fear of missing out, uh, sociological force, right? If you think that there is going to be money made, then you spin up an NFT and then people go, Ooh, I really want a part of that, even though it's being misrepresented. And there are ways to verify if the NFT is being offered by someone. You try and get in touch with Snoop Dogg's spokesperson so that you can find out if there's misrepresentation, but you have to do your due diligence. But fear of missing out just short circuits everybody's critical thinking skills and they go off and they spend the money and then it disappears. Good luck trying to chase these people down. The domestic counterpart will get brought to justice, but the foreign aspect of it, probably not. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm actually done for today. Um, 
It's been a long week. I'm really sorry that I'm cutting it short, uh, but um, yeah, I need uh, I need to do some more work as mayor of Omtown, and uh, it's not going to get done if I don't bow out early. So we're at about an hour. Actually, we're about about thirty minutes at this point. But at any rate, um, I will come back tomorrow, uh, bright eyed and bushy tailed, and. Uh, We'll probably be doing news and some gaming, pretty chill, listening to music, hanging out, that kind of thing. Uh, so stop by and um, I look forward to seeing you all. Take care. See you tomorrow. Bye bye.